Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Image and imitation. In the Orthodox Church before us are many images. We think in language and we visualize in pictures. And often these pictures help us to form a mental concept of truths or ideas trying to be expressed and conveyed. Other times, we don't have a mental picture, but we have a physical example. Someone who has shown how to do things or how to be by their way of life. In today's Gospel reading, which chronologically in the Gospel happened right after the transfiguration of our Savior, he was transfigured on the mountain, they came down, and his father brought his son to Jesus, asking him to help. He had already brought his son to the disciples, but they were unable to cast out the demon. And our Savior says, This kind never comes out except by prayer and fasting. So what is prayer and what is fasting? Prayer is when we set ourselves apart and talk with God. We don't merely talk with him like we do a friend. He is our friend after all, but he also is our Lord and Savior, and we have to acknowledge him as such. In last week's Gospel, after the Savior sent the crowds away, he himself went to the, to the mountain apart to pray. Even if in the midst of daily circumstances, we can't set ourselves apart or even find a quiet room. We can sit quietly. We can still the thoughts in our mind and pray to our Lord that he help us, that he guide us, and that gives us the strength to follow his example and the example of the apostles and all the saints who persevere and who did what was necessary to mortify their flesh, to mortify the passions, and to make the heart and soul receptive to God's divine grace. In the Old Testament, Moses, before he was allowed to encounter God, fasted 40 days. Elijah, before he was allowed to encounter God, fasted 40 days. And our Savior, immediately after his baptism, went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days. And he withstood the temptation of the devil who appeared to him. We have just completed the 
the short Dormition fast, the two weeks of fasting prior to the Feast of Our Lady's falling asleep, which the Church celebrated yesterday. So we talked about prayer, now what about fasting? Fasting is not just about food. Yes, fasting from food does help when we are satiated, when we are comfortable, when we are full, we are less inclined to pray, less inclined to think of others and just be content with our current situation. But fasting is not just related to food. Fasting is refraining from evil, from hearing evil, from seeing evil, and from speaking evil. St. John Chrysostom says, What good is it? What does it profit a man if he fasts from birds and fish and other meat? And yet, devour his brother. If we gossip, if we slander somebody, or if we are mean to somebody, or do, if we miss the mark by any other means, We are not fasting, because the demons have given us an example. They don't eat, they fast, and yet, well, they fast from food, but they do not fast from doing evil. So whenever we have a necessity in life that requires a decision that is weighty, that is significant, that is consequential, we turn to the Lord in prayer and fasting. It could be as simple as just skipping one meal. One of the diets that's fashionable today is intermittent fasting. I guess modern science has found useful what the fathers already knew. So maybe if we have an important doctor's appointment or somebody else has some trial going on in their lives and asks us to pray for them, maybe we skip a meal and spend the time in prayer. Because when we add fasting to our prayer, it becomes that much stronger. We are giving of ourselves. We are sacrificing of ourselves. And we are imitating Christ just like he emptied himself and sacrificed himself for all of mankind. The Apostle Paul writes in today's epistle, of course he's speaking about persecution, but even if we are not overtly persecuted, we can take this advice and counsel to heart. He writes, To the present hour, we hunger and thirst, and we are ill-clad and buffeted and homeless, and we labor, working with our own hands. And this is key. Just like our Savior did not avenge himself at his passion, she once again predicted in today's gospel. So too the apostle enjoins us. When we when reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become and are now as the refuse of this world, the offscouring 
of all things. I do not write this to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. This is key, that we do not lose heart when misfortune befalls us. Misfortune has befallen the saints, and misfortune and persecution has befallen the church in previous centuries. This church is the church of the martyrs. Our Savior did not seek an earthly kingdom. And so too we should not seek an earthly kingdom here. We do not preach the prosperity gospel. We do not count it blessed when we win, or we make a lot of money, or we are successful, or have any other worldly standard that is admired by the powers of this world. As I've been saying the past couple of weeks, because the apostle has been enjoining those to whom he was writing to take up their cross because the preaching of the cross to those who are perishing is foolishness. So, as he was writing today that he and the other apostles who have been persecuted and slandered they have not returned evil with evil but evil with good. The world says to return evil for evil, but our Savior says to turn the other cheek. He gave us an example. And the Holy Apostle gives us an example and goes further and says, I urge you to be imitators of me because he himself was imitating Christ. So now how does this, this imitation fit in with images and imagery? Well today we commemorate the translation of the image of our Savior not made by hands because Prince Avgar was afflicted with a certain malady and sent servants to the Savior asking that they be allowed to draw his image because he assumed our Savior was busy, would not be able to visit him, so at least maybe an image of him that he could look upon would be useful in overcoming his illness. Our Savior granted his, his wish, and then some. He took a napkin, wiped his face on it, and the image of his face was imprinted on that napkin. And it was sent to Prince Avgar, who recovered. Not completely, about 90, 95%. And the last remaining percent was finally cured when he accepted Christian baptism. But it is through this image of our Savior because he became man, he assumed matter and sanctified matter. And therefore, to the Orthodox, matter matters. He became, our Savior became man and we can depict him because he depicted himself. We know what our Savior looked like. We don't worship an unknown God. He has a face. We know what he looks like. 
and every time we gaze upon his most pure image, we should try to become more like him. Because he was the first in all things, giving us an example. And we should take courage because we too can overcome the world knowing that he has overcome the world. And as he said in last Sunday's Gospel, take courage, do not be afraid. And so too, having the image of our Savior before us, which we bow down to every morning and evening, we should take courage. Because we don't live this present life for the sake of the present life, but for the life to come. And what is the life to come? We have this other image here of the feast of the Dormition, or falling asleep of the Theotokos. <coughs> What do we see in this icon? We, of course, see Our Lady's body laid out on the funeral bier. But in the background, what do we see? Our Savior is holding appears to be a swallowed baby or child. This is, of course, iconographic because just as his most pure mother held him in her arms at the moment of his birth, He was there to receive the soul of his mother. Depicted as a pure small child, he was there to receive it at the moment of her death. This is what we pray for when we say a Christian ending to our lives. As I've said before, not one word of the liturgy or of the services of the Orthodox Church is an idle or extraneous word. Every word has meaning. And sometimes we need to step back and reflect what each words mean what each of the words mean that we are praying. So today, dear brothers and sisters, let us have this image of the Theotokos before us when we pray for a Christian ending to our lives. May our Savior, whom we try to imitate every day of our lives, appear to us and receive our souls at the moment of our death, as long as as we stay faithful to him and his holy church. So let us take courage. Let us be joyful. And let us always give thanks for Almighty God for being our example for giving us his most pure mother as a most powerful intercessor for us. And for also giving us his apostles and all the saints as wonderful examples for us to imitate. So that this remembrance, this imitation, and this imagery be ever with us. Let us not look to the things of this world. Let us not distract ourselves with the 
distractions of this world. Let us fast from whatever is unprofitable for us. And let us fill our minds and hearts with these wonderful images of our Savior, His Mother, and His Saints, and the blessed life which is to come, so that we truly may all be together with our Savior and each other in paradise. Amen. say with all our soul and with all our minds let us say O lord almighty the god of our fathers we pray thee hearken and have mercy lord, have mercy <coughs> have mercy on us O god according to thy great mercy we pray thee hearken and have mercy Pray for pious and orthodox Christians. <coughs> Again, we pray for our Father Metropolitan Joseph.